Hi there, Trippy Collie here. I've had a lot of friends who are curious about how I built my own remote internet setup, and I thought I'd put together a video showing what all was involved with that process. Before I get started, here's what all to expect in the specific video. First, I'm gonna cover like why I need to actually create this setup um, for my area and everything. Then I'll do a high level overview of the entire layout for this setup. Third, I'm gonna go ahead and show how everything was put into place. And lastly, I'll give a brief discussion of everything that I used. So if you're interested, take a look in the video description below for detailed product information and links for all the items that I'll be discussing. Uh, keep in mind that links may have changed since the creation of this video, but you can always do a search based on the product information I provided below. Lastly, there's timestamps, so you can jump around in the video to any parts that you're specifically interested in. With that being said, let's get right into it. So why did I need this setup? I live in a very rural area. Uh, it's quite remote compared to most people. Specifically, I live in a mountain valley filled with redwoods. It's like 15 minutes away from the nearest city. You can't get cell signal where I live. Uh, cable internet isn't available and DSL is only sort of available. Before I created the internet setup shown in this video, the only option we had was DSL service provided by AT&T. Uh, I hesitate to call it service since our DSL crashed multiple times every day and when it did work the speeds were barely usable uh, compared to modern standards. As an example, if my husband was watching something on Netflix and I was surfing online at the same time then we would both have a slow choppy experience and that's assuming DSL was able to maintain the connection. All that DSL setup had perfectly functional equipment. Uh, the issues with the service were related to distance factors and AT&T not wishing to upgrade our equipment or increase support to the low population area that I live in. We suffered with that as our only internet option for over 20 years. So how did I figure out how to do our current setup? I'm not a network engineer, but I do have some tech background and I have a close friend who's a wizard with anything related to technology. Basically, he figured out this setup. He was going to get a directed Wi-Fi setup from a tower that is over at Mount Madonna, which is about 2.1 miles away from here as the crow flies, a direct line of sight. He climbed up his mountainside behind his house, chopped down a redwood to basically open up some window for view, and then he put all the equipment into place and got everything working. So basically, I just copied his setup, but figured out how I was going to make it work for my own property. I wanted to have a proper path in place, so it would be easy if I had to have technicians go up and down and work on my equipment. Well, given all of that, there was quite a few factors to take into consideration. Before we get into how I built my setup up the hillside and put everything in place, let's do a broad level overview, a high level overview of exactly how my setup is put together. So first of all, I have a new ISP, and that is Etheric Networks. They have a tower, which has base stations on it, which are basically these radio transmitters that are blasting out LTE signal, or wireless broadband, which uh, is providing a fixed wireless internet plan for us. And what I have on my side is a Telrad dish, and this is the very top. That's the end of my setup, so we're kind of working in reverse here. This dish basically receives the radio signals, the LTE signals from the tower, and from there, there is a Ethernet surge protector, which is basically just protecting the equipment from any power surges. And we'll talk about the cabling that goes between all of these things in just a minute which you can see featured in this, which is an Ethernet repeater. So it's called a GPER, which basically stands for Gigabit Passive Ethernet Repeater. And basically you can see in the center there, there's a little black piece, that's the repeater itself. There's power over Ethernet cable that's going between each of these devices. And because of the length of the line, you have to have these connections, these repeaters that continue the signal up. So the next thing along this is going to be an outdoor switch, which uh, in this case is a Ubiquiti Switch Flex. Uh, this is outdoor radio, it can be in the rain, it has been in the rain and all the flooding at the beginning of the year. Beyond that, there is another repeater, and then there is going to be the PoE injector. So this little piece, this PoE injector, power over ethernet injector, it plugs into standard AC on the side that you can't see the uh, where things plug in. The side that you can see here on the front where things plug in, there's one ethernet cable that basically goes uh, from this up the hillside to that Telrad dish through all those pieces I just went over. That other port is basically going to a thing called 
Universal Dream Machine, which is also from Ubiquity. Basically, I had purchased this, and it is what people might think of as their standard router. It does Wi-Fi to devices, and you can also hardwire it, as you can see with the various plugs on the back of it. So to do the hardwiring, I also had to have an indoor switch. This one is not power over Ethernet, but it does provide all the various plugins to go ahead and connect to my various equipment, such as my desktop computer for like work, personal use, as well as a security system, which I have here in the house. Uh, the UDM, the Universal Dream Machine, also provides Wi-Fi, so I can have all my standard devices connected. So you can see here like cell phone, iPad, Roku, Chromecast, things of that nature. That gives kind of a broad level overview of how everything is connected together. Let's get into how I actually had to build the infrastructure for this here on my property. The first part to building the network basically involved figuring out the path all the way to the top of the mountainside where I was going to be placing the Telrad dish for my setup. So first I went up the hillside and you can see here in this sped up footage that I'm chopping branches out of the way so I basically have a clear path to go up and down through everything. And I'd also laid out some survey twine through everything to get a rough idea of exactly where the cabling was going to be going in as straight a line as I could basically get it. And with that once the line was spread the entire distance, when I was finished, I had to go ahead and recollect that entire line. You can see me really quickly, I sped the footage way up here, wrapping all the twine back up. And that's because I had to measure the amount of twine so I would know roughly how much cable I would need to reach from the back of my house all the way up the mountainside to where the Telrad receiver was going to be placed. The next portion that had to be performed was actually moving the pavers from across my bridge all the way over to an area to load them, which is right here. And then you can see I have to put them in a backpack to carry up the mountainside, up the entire path, and just keep moving them from my car across our bridge, up the hillside, up this long mountain path, until I have an area where I can actually put the steps in place. I started with the upper area first, just so I could go ahead and do the digging up top and slowly work my way back down towards the bottom. Uh, this is sped up over 600%, uh, but you can see there's a lot of work involved here. I'm moving about three of these pavers at a time. They're about 18 and a half pounds each. So that's a lot of weight on my back going up and a almost 45 degree angle. And you can see it's all sped up here, but basically I have to dig out each step with a shovel, then pick up the paver and move it into place. Uh, I wish that it would have been this fast in real life. This was definitely the hardest portion of this project. After that, basically we were looking at moving the networking cable, which I created, not shown here, and actually put it into place along the hillside with those ends that I had terminated, and then I had to test it. Ah, beautiful. Pass, all my numbers match, and I got shielding. First 300 feet is solid. Once that first section was in place, I went ahead and continued the line up the hillside. You can see that I'm climbing all through a bunch of stuff here at very steep angles. You can even see in this shot it's a little bit tilted. It's actually more steep than it shows. About 70 degree angle. And I'm climbing through poison oak and everything else and just hoping that I'm not messing up the terminal connections. And so here I check the next 300 feet. Oh, thank heavens. 600 feet working. Woohoo! After that, it was just a short distance to the top where the dish was going to be facing the tower. It's all connected up. Moment of truth. Oh, yeah, baby. All 710 feet of cable. And what's the end game? We're aiming for this guy over here. Yes. Yes. With all the cable in place, it was now time to provide a little bit of safety for the technicians that would be installing the dish, as well as myself, and so I put some thick outdoor rated nylon rope in place. You can see as I look down right here, uh, there's quite a drop, so this rope was definitely necessary as an extra safety precaution. Also, I had to bring poles up to the top so I could go ahead and mount the actual dish, as well as the switch. I don't actually have footage of the switch pole, but same sort of concept here. Pound the pole in place and get everything connected. 
That brings us to the final portion of the process, at least on my side of things, before having Etheric Network get involved, and that's testing all of the equipment. I've already tested the Ethernet cable going the whole way up, power over Ethernet is working and everything, but let's make sure all the components work. So you can see I called in my tech savvy friend, he's having me go through all of the configuration of the Universal Dream Machine for my setup, as well as testing the switches and making sure that every single component works. Not shown here, we did test the repeaters as well and put them into their outdoor rated enclosures. Now that everything was in place, it was time to have Etheric Networks bring their technicians out. And as you can see in this very quickly sped up climbing the hill footage, uh, it's almost Blair Witch-esque with the jerkiness, apologies for that. Basically, we took them all the way up to the top, and from there we started going ahead and adjusting the dish in its place, which you can see here. And once that was all affixed and set, it was just a quick phone call, which was connected over at the other pole with the switch. And from there, we were doing adjustments to go ahead and have the internet refined. Refinements were pretty straightforward. It's basically just adjusting the dish and us checking with speed tests, as you can see here with my laptop, which was connected into a portable router we had connected on the switch. We basically just moved the dish around. They did a couple adjustments over on Etheric end, and as you can see, we now had proper functioning internet. You may remember back with AT&T that our buffer bloat rating was D. Not really great, especially with our latency and uh, I wanted to have a comparison. So after everything was configured, I went ahead and did a buffer bloat test with Etheric, and these are the results. Obviously far superior. Now that we're done with everything, I'd like to take a little bit of a deep dive into the various components that I mentioned earlier in the overview of my network, just so I can give a thorough explanation and you can understand what all those components were about. If you want to skip this section, you don't want to nerd out, totally fine. The video is done for you. Otherwise, if you want more, keep on watching. So first up, the SwitchFlex Mini. This is provided by Ubiquity. I had to buy this personally myself. It basically was just giving me more ports to be able to physically connect different hardware within my house, such as I mentioned the desktop and the security system that I had. Um, from the back of the Dream Machine, which connects to this, this is what's actively providing my internets, routing everything to it from that Telrad dish. Basically, there was only one port available on the back after everything was connected. I had to connect in on the back here, you can see I'd have to connect in uh, one cable going to the power over Ethernet injector. I had to have another cable connecting to the device itself. And then I only had one other port available after that. So literally, I did not have a lot of available slots. So that's why I needed the switch in my house. This Dream Machine is also provided by Ubiquity. I did have to buy that myself. Uh, this was providing my Wi-Fi resource and my hardwired resource. Um, the friend had a different setup, but this is what worked for me because I didn't want to have a separate Wi-Fi device. So I also mentioned having a uh, power of Ethernet injector. This is specifically the one that I got. Uh, actually, when I went through Etheric Networks, they provided one for me along with their Telrad dish. That was part of my plan to pay with them and have a directed Wi-Fi setup. Basically, with that, I had... One already provided for my Telrad dish, I had this one as a backup. This was recommended by the technology savvy friend. Uh, next thing up, cable. Need to have some actual uh, networking cable because these are long runs of cable for my specific situation. 300 feet uh, it requires a repeater on top of that. I had to make my own internet cable, so my network cable. I had to buy all the equipment and the tools to be able to do this. I don't show that in this video. Uh, you can look that resource up elsewhere. But basically, I had a pair of cutters, cable cutters, to go ahead and expose the cable. I then had to have a ratcheting modular data cable crimper, which was able to strip the line. And once I was done actually adding the network cable into the actual plug here, uh, it basically would go ahead and cut the little pieces off and crimp it all together. And then I use this tester, which you saw in the video, which is basically just a cable tester to make sure that the networking is actually working. You could see that I was checking to see if my shielding was showing as shielded, that I didn't disrupt it somehow, moving the cable up the hillside. And I was also checking all the numbers across here to make sure that they were functional for each of the individual wires that are internal. Next up, I had that relay. 
uh, because I had a long internet run that was 710 feet of cable to my dish, uh, anytime you go past 300 feet, uh, and even a little bit less, you should go ahead and have on an Ethernet repeater. This basically takes that power that's provided from the power over Ethernet injector that goes all the way up to my dish, and it extends it further up the cable. I have no idea what kind of black magic it uses to do that, but basically you put this in between two long runs of cable and it will keep extending up to a set amount of distance. I think it's a little bit over 1,100 feet, if I recall correctly, from the friend. Uh, next thing you may not have seen in the video, but I had a case that goes over this repeater that was inside this case in the middle. That's because this is outside, so this is basically waterproofing to protect that repeater. And speaking of which, that cable that I mentioned, this guy back here, that is also waterproof. It is outdoor, it is shielded, UV resistant, etc. I basically just have it lying on the ground. I didn't want to cover it up by things because it's easier to replace if it gets damaged with, say, a falling tree on my path. Uh, the next thing up at the top, uh, towards the end of my run, I had a switch, a flex switch. And that was great to test the area and everything. Would you necessarily need this for your specific network setup if you do this type of thing? Maybe not, but for me it gave a good option since we're so far above, we had no cell signal. We could then plug in devices to here to have the internet working and test things right there at the switch. So it was really useful for my specific setup the way that it is. Uh, next thing, I had an Ethernet surge protector. Uh, these are both Ubiquiti products, by the way, the Flex Switch, or the Switch Flex, and the Ethernet surge protector. Uh, the surge protector basically is just protecting the entire line, so none of the damaged, uh, none of the equipment gets damaged with any power surges. And last but not least, the actual Telrad dish. So this was provided again by Etheric Networks, and uh, I paid a certain amount for this, but you know, am I going to have to use it somewhere else? Probably not, specifically with them. And that's because I'm using a fixed wireless setup to receive that LTE radio signal. Uh, I also have a page here that I have pulled up. I'm going to go ahead and link it in the information down below. If you're curious to know about what is fixed wireless internet and what are the benefits, pros and cons, how does it work, all of that's here. Hopefully this video gave you a good introduction to it all. Um, but yeah, it's the great solution for me. Costs a little bit more than I was paying for AT&T, except it actually is highly functional and is always on. Uh, barring some sort of crazy issue with like, say, hail destroying a dish, which actually happened recently a couple weeks ago. So anyhow, that's the whole video. I hope you found this useful and thanks for watching.